In this edition of Garden Talk with the Tulsa Master Gardeners, we continue our series on diseases in tomatoes as we discuss non-infectious tomato diseases. Then we'll discuss an easy way for you to do your spring plant shopping right from home and how to use pre-emergence to control landscape weeds. Welcome to Garden Talk. Welcome back. Here we are again, the next edition of uh, Garden Talk with the Tulsa Master Gardeners. Tom Ingram here with Brian Jervis. Howdy, howdy. How are you today? I'm pretty good today. Looking pretty good. Good today. Good yeah. day. Yeah. Approaching the end of February here. Got March. Garden season is just like... Man, we can see it. Right there on the horizon. We, we can, can smell see it. it almost. Potatoes are getting close. I think we have potatoes? a question on that. We have a question on potatoes. Potatoes are getting close. So you get potatoes and onions and it's all downhill or uphill from there, whatever you want to look at. It's game on. It's ready. It's yep. ready. <clears throat> so this week we're going to... Part three of our tomato diseases that so we did uh, fungal and bacteria, virus, nematodes. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to talk about uh, non-infectious diseases with just stuff that just happens. Kind of environmental type Environmental stuff. problems. Good thing is, is these are a lot easier yeah. to diagnose than our others. So, a little bit more obvious. Yeah, it's kind of obvious. You know, you got cat facing, you got, you know, just awkward hey, don't give it a Oh, yeah, but just <laughs> all these different things that, you know. Right. <laughs> we blame everything on the environment if we don't know what it is. Yeah, so it must be uh, we, environmental. We lump we lump it into it. So it's environmental. It's the weather. Right. So, but in in this case, and, and a few of these cases that we're going to talk about, yes, it is the weather, or it's just kind of common. Uh, we just kind of see them, and right. um, so yeah, it's a it's kind of a fun one to do as well. So again, part this is the third part. So I hope these are going to be useful for everybody to kind of refer back to. And like I said, we've been in the past, we've been kind of going off our uh, fact sheets. So uh, one, two, and three. So if you watch this, pull out one of these three fact sheets and you can kind of follow through and get a little more detailed. Um, but um, that's, you know, that uh, growing tomatoes is a challenge. And it's easier to go to the store and buy them, but that, that takes the fun out of it. So uh, right. we're going to help you through these processes. Well, this this first problem, blossom drop. I mean, it's we we get a lot of questions about this in the in the garden in our diagnostic center over here. Yeah. Like, hey, my plants quit. Yeah. That's the problem. And it's one of those that it, it is it is part it is Mother Nature's fault on on right. blossom drop, or we just don't get enough to you know we don't get enough fruit set. Why is the fruit not setting? Why is that blossom dropping? Um, mostly temperature. Mostly temperature. It can be mostly high temperature, but it can be cool temperature as well. But for the most part, we're looking at those higher temperatures when the nights get, you know, when they don't get below 70, 60, 75, right. uh, when it just doesn't cool down. So, you know, or on the higher end of that, you know, 85 to 90, uh, pretty much constant throughout the day. Um, that, August, basically. August, <laughs> July sometimes. Right. But when our when our tomatoes don't set, that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind. Um, they they just they we got too hot. It 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 burnt. It kind of heated up that pistol, um, getting into that plant, that that male that that brings that that pollen down that tube. Right. Uh, scientifically, it, it kind of gets too hot for that thing to to, to take that down. So it just kind of shrivels away and falls off. So if you're seeing a lot of blooms that have fallen down onto the ground, um, that's more than likely what it is. It's just the, the temperatures haven't been in that range. Right. So when you're you're fruiting, just kind of disappears. That's the hard part to get your tomato plants through that July and August. And then most of them, if you can get them to survive, they'll perk back up as it cools off in the fall and still get, and you still, get like almost another crop. Still have a kind of a fall crop, if right. you will, and, and taking care of your plants and not getting those diseases and bacteria yeah, that we talked go. about prior to. Right. But, um, you know, blossom drops a, a, a fairly, you know, it's it's not an easy way to fix. I mean, there is no fix. No, if, really. if they are losing it, I mean, if we're getting too hot and, and we can cover our plants up to try to cool it down a little bit uh, with whether it's a sheet or a shade cloth or you know anything that can help cool it enough but that's going to be a challenge because you know usually when we're in those temperatures we're in them and mm -hmm. we're gonna we're gonna be in them for a length of well, time. Well and at night if it doesn't cool down at night there's really not much. Not can, much you can fight. Much it, you can it's not, just but be patient. It but. is and you know another thing we may fertilize too much that's kind of number two that comes into mind we've put too much nitrogen on our plants right. so they're growing. If they're really growing healthy and growing fast and our temperatures aren't that in that hot range um, we could be 
growing the plant too much and it's not wanting to flower. So that's another thing that this th that, that you know blossom drop could be. They just may not be putting out the blossoms. So uh, that's another thing to think of. Don't over fertilize or, or don't treat your plants too well. You know, you, you kind of need to stress them a little to cause them to flower um, in, in certain cases. So taking off the fertilizer, uh, taking out of the water, not watering them as much, that can help us trigger, hey, I need to reproduce because I'm about to, you know, get in a stressful situation. So they'll start putting on flowers, mm -hmm. possibly. Um, so, you know, some varieties um, on, on these as well can, can be notorious for not setting fruit or not putting on blossoms. So as in most of these, you're gonna hear problems that we ha are gonna talk about today. They are, they, you know, varieties is a big deal. Um, varieties matter. Yeah, varieties matter. So, yeah, blossom drop, kind of a, a you know, a think of an obvious one, but, you know, a few things that you make it do different and uh, try to get them past that point. All right, well, we talked about the, the those diseases previously. This is like an environmental. A lot of these are environmental. Yep. And, and again, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Not much there. Just, kind of a you given. You can kind of, but anyway, you're, you're just going to have to deal kind with of, it. Kind of given. Yep. The next one definitely blossom end rot. That's actually a, a calcium deficiency, Tom. So right. uh, all we have to do is put calcium on this thing. No, right? no, 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 no. It's <laughs> it's rarely a soil calcium deficiency. Yeah, right. It's, yeah. it's typically because of, of variations in water, too much water. Yeah. Now yeah. the watering is not consistent. So maybe we skip a couple waterings and it wilts down, and then we flood it and hydrate it heavily, and then we may not get back to it again for a few days. Uh, with water and then it's droughted again. So right. over that that pattern over time will cause calcium not to be able to take be taken up from the plant and definitely get calcium throughout that 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 fruit. So you'll usually see this or this will be towards the end, towards that blossom end of that tomato, not the stem end. Right. So uh, you'll usually see browning, um, that browning you know, this has progressed pretty good and there's rot that's got in here. So there's some fungus that has got in here, but that that damage is that blossom end starts turning brown and then it just gets bigger and bigger when it can't pull up enough cal or when it can't use enough calcium within that plant. So you'll so see in, this. In theory, uh, yes, it is a calcium deficiency. However, adding more calcium is not going to be the, the, the fix because it's the, the moisture, the wetness has affected the roots. To inhibit it, uptaking the calcium. Yeah. It doesn't matter how much calcium is. Yeah. You, and you can pour, you can put tums in the bottom, or you can put <laughs> any any yeah, other type that, yeah. of calcium in there, but it still won't won't pull it up. Or spray calcium, even I've seen that on the stores. Right. Uh, may help a little, but but not not enough to, to be messing with. More uh, standard watering practices. Yeah. Mulch it mulch it in. And then water more consistently, and that that will help. Or in some cases, like I said, varieties get it real bad. So there's some Roma tomatoes out there that I've grown that I couldn't get a, a ripe fruit because of this thing. Yeah. So I, I blamed it on it wasn't me that was not watering it right. Oh, of course not. It was the variety. It must have been the weather that year. It was, it was bad. So yeah, like I said, those Romas, that particular one of mine was Romas. I ended up just pulling a plant out because it wasn't producing right. anything worth worthwhile. So uh, that so varieties maybe changing a variety next year. If you've had a couple right. years in a row that you've had this on the one you like, the variety you like, switch it out and see if that helps. If possibly. Else. Possibly. But yep, blossom and rot. Cat face, which is kind of an interesting name for this, but uh, again, an environmental thing. It, it is, and, and, and a variety thing too. Um, you know, you know those big beef eater, beef eaters, and some of them big ones. Right. They tend to have some of those weird lines and cat facing on the backside. Right. Um, but this one, this one in general uh, is going to be low temperatures. It's this gotten too gonna, cold. It's got too cold. So we're, we're trucking along real good in June, July, uh, you know, May and June, and then we get a cold snap, you know, 60 degree weather that the plant's not used to. Right. Um, anything below that could possibly cause this to, to, to happen. And that's an, an ab it causes a, an abnormal development in the flower yeah. itself. So that's what has come to pass here. That shows up in the fruit shows later. Shows up in the fruit later on. Right. Yeah, yeah, later on. And, you know, just like on the other one, this thing will, this thing's, good to eat it's fine to eat you just cut it off and go on but 
it has exposed, it has cracked that skin, exposed that flesh to be open. So all those sugars in that tomato is open and ready for a fungus to get in there and start rotting it. Right. And that's usually what happens. We start rotting and then we, we, we lose that fruit there. That right. fruit's not sellable, but for homeowners, it's yep. it's pretty good to you know you can usually cut it off and go on if it's not too bad. So but. it's not diseased. It's more of a cosmetic. <laughs> yeah, it affects just, the development of the yeah, other fruit yeah. early on, and then as right. it progresses and ripens, it can rot. But cat facing pretty again variety. Uh, variety, uh, variety. Um, some are pretty notorious to uh, to to have cat facing, but uh, change it up. And this is again hammers the fact down that we don't want to plant one type of, of tomato. We want as many different ones as we can get out there because some will have it, some won't. So another important thing to keep in mind when we're when we're planning, getting ready to plant, which we're doing now. Yep. Yep. That's right. Yep. So that was cat face. Next up, we got sun scald, and, and the, this one, unless you can block out the sun, there's not a whole lot. Not a whole lot you can do. But I it's mean, a direct sunlight, right? It either caused because your plant's not robust enough, not a lot. It's not getting a lot of cover from the leaves. Yeah. yeah. So that August, we say August, that July August sun is hitting them, and yeah, and then just melting, you know, burning the top of that fruit. Right. And you're usually, it's usually going to be at the top, and you'll usually see this really quick because you're going to see it because it's exposed as well. Right. Um, you know, in variety trials and variety selections, sometimes we get tomatoes that produce so many tomatoes and don't produce enough leaves. Uh -huh. So, right. you know, that, that can happen in, in this case where we don't have enough leaves to kind of shade it out. Um, then it's going to tend to burn. So we may have produced a whole bunch of fruit on that particular variety that we're trying out. Um, if we don't have enough leaves to cover it, then it won't do us any good. So um, they are going to scald and there's going to be issues. So can you do a physical cover? You can. <clears throat> I've seen people put sheets over, just plain white sheets, maybe four stakes or you know something to help break that heat of the heat of the day sun up and that's you know that three to five o'clock three to six o'clock range if we can block that sun out and then everything else can be exposed that'll be fine but anything to help help keep that away um, promote healthy plants uh, yeah. promote healthy leaves uh, is going to help as well but you're probably all, you're always going to get a few of these that's going to happen and if if we don't have as many leaves this year then it'll it'll be a better you know a better year for sun scald if you will but uh, nothing no sunscreen you can put on them or anything like that but you know maybe a maybe a sheet or something right. uh, uh, just to get them through that heat of the heat of the day or plant them in a way where maybe they get some shading from that that late afternoon sun. I know yeah. mine, where mine are, the house shades that three to five o'clock sun out of perfect there, so timing. it doesn't get that beat down every day. So you don't have that. that I've never had difficult that. Difficult. I've had some of the spell. others. Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> so and then next we've got this uh, herbicide injury, which is not necessarily herbicide you've applied to these plants, but the herbicide drift. Yeah, right? dri drift is an issue with us, and, and we use quite a few different hormone herbicides that, that does tend to volatilize and move. So, you know, we've got to be careful using those, whether it's you used them or your neighbor used them or, uh, you know, somebody else applied two blocks away and then, you know, they volatilized up and moved over and then went back down. That can happen too. So we just, that's one of the reasons we got to be careful when we're applying herbicides um, and then any particular ones because this particular one is pretty, pretty bad on these tender, fast growing tomatoes. Um, and then any other plants like that, you know, peppers get it as well, eggplants. Um, roses, a lot of things can be affected by herbicide damage that we didn't necessarily apply to that site, but they right. moved over to it. So, yeah. It's well, what, for example, the two of them that get listed are 2,4-D and dicamba, which are very popular uh, for weeds mm -hmm. in your yeah. yard. So yeah. if you're out there with a sprayer and you're spraying this on your yard, and those sprayers, part of it goes to mist. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. and if you're just right out there next to your vegetable garden and that mist is kind of drifting over to your plants, you've got a potential problem. Pretty there. easily done that way, yeah. So, I mean, we've got a, you know, that this is, it's kind of odd because this is time where we don't want just no wind at all. We, we want a little bit of wind when we apply Maybe our right. herbicides. Right. And that what that does, that gets it out of there. Uh, if we had no wind at all, it's going to hit, and then it may sit or it may rise a little bit, move, and then we get, you know, maybe just, and then drops, that, that those droplets can drop over. 
So um, we actually need a little bit of wind to get that out of there. But again, it hammers the fact home. This is, you know, it usually happens when we, uh, you know, on tender growth, newer growth. So it may happen at the top right. or it may start showing up at the top. Um, the, the, where the bottom, the more mature, thicker leaves may not curl as much as these top tender leaves would. But curl, you know, cupping, um, we'll have a good picture of this on there, but that those veins straighten up and it kind of makes a cup. So the veins in general on a tomato leaf are net-like. You know, there's really no pattern. There's, there's just kind of a net-like pattern mm. is all it is. And when we apply, when we see damage in herbicide injury, those veins tend to straighten up. So they'll, they'll tend to, it's odd, they'll straighten up and then it'll usually form a cup or a tip at the end of the leaf. Mm. So um, kind of things to look at. Um, it's not necessarily fatal. Right. Um, you know, this particular <clears throat> plant, it's hard to see, but I would probably go in and prune this out a little bit and see if we can get some new growth that's not affected. It's not necessarily in the plant, but it's, it's it, you know, it's that tender growth that can't, can't fight that off. That's why it's curling up the, mm. and why the older ones are not really affected. It's still there, they just aren't affected as much as the tender ones are. Right. So if you see something like that, you go like, ah, that may uh, be what's going on. Don't necessarily take a shotgun over to your neighbor <laughs> and say, this is your fault, because it's not, it's never that easy. You never can figure out right. where it come from, unless it's obvious and you knew that you sprayed that day and showed up a couple days later. But, right. you know, it just takes, it, it takes neighbors, keep your neighbors friends and keep right. them Get friends. Along. That's right. That's right. 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 All right. Next is this, this other one that's uh, physiological leaf roll yeah so this this one occurs later on in the season 2,4-D damage and, and herbicide damage will occur earlier on. So, you know, till about June, and it'll happen throughout, but it mostly happens when we're applying a lot of weeds, weed controls. And that's going to, on the 2,4-D on the, uh, uh, damage or herbicide damage. So right. April, May, June, if we're seeing curling and cupping, more than likely that's going to be herbicide damage. Don't see a lot of this during that time. We're, see, we're seeing a lot of this in July and August when the temperatures are a little warm and it's just kind of a, the plant's kind of mad and just starts curling leaves. Yeah. And it's about the only way to explain it. Is this a varietal thing as well or? Not as really? in with all the others, yeah. some varieties are notorious to do More this susceptible. later in the season. Yeah, right. later in the season. So, you know, it's not hurting anything. I mean, you're curling it up and the plant's not gonna be as robust and big um, and it may not ripen the fruit as fast. And this, this fruit may be some, uh, su subject to sunburn, sunscald. Sun so uh, we, 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 it's not necessarily a killer, but it's one of those that we probably need to, you know, it, it's probably getting on its last leg at that point. Right. But they're still making photosynthesis, still, still, still creating some stuff and growing, but it's just not growing as robust as it was. So. Right. And, and like you said, a lot of these things can uh, contribute to another Another condition, like like this contributes to the, the sun skull. The right? sun skull, so yeah. So it's, it's, it's likely not just a one-issue thing. Yeah, and it's kind of like that oil and gas on the on the nutrients. If you don't have everything right, right. Then, then, you know, not everything will grow very well. But, you know, you, you want to blame us on lack of water, but it's not always. It's, right. it's usually a stressor that causes it, and it's usually the temperature and the moisture in August that, that causes it. But... Um, yeah, prune it, prune it out the best you can. See if that helps. See if you can get it through that ne those next month, and then if you can, you can probably get a, again a fall crop. Mm -hmm. uh, the plant can grow, and if it can flower again, it should be good to go. So, but yep, physiological leaf row, kind of one of those odd, <laughs> odd things we see. So. All right. All right. So that concludes our three-part series on tomato yeah. issues, yeah. and uh, we'll we'll see if the tomato sales in Tulsa County go decrease. <laughs> go down. We, <laughs> we don't want them to decrease. But, but I, you know, like we've both grown tomatoes, and we've seen maybe some of these, but we, not all of them. You yeah, know, it's it, like just sporadic problems. And it is. And one year you may see one, and one year you may see the other. But you know, like I, like we've kind of described, you, you've got three different ones. You've got the fungus. 
uh, that there's a whole bunch of those, and though you know we talked about that, you've got the bacteria and viruses, and then nematodes. So the bacteria is a little challenging because they all look similar, right. um, but the treatment's very close too. And there's not a lot. I mean, you've got copper to add with your fungicides that may help us a little to to, to slow down a little bit of them bacteria that we talked about. Right. And then you got you know, these natural um, non-infectious diseases that we hit today, and that one, you know. Those are, you know, kind of mother nature blaming it on her and then, you know, hopefully do a few things. We're going to be able to grow tomatoes. We've always been able to. It's just... It's just job security for us. So, <laughs> so it, if you get tomatoes, if you get to delicious tomatoes in your garden, good job. Good job. You done good. That's <laughs> right. All these things you could have been challenged with, but you ended up with a good fruit. Yeah, it, it's a it's a fun challenge, and we'll we'll grow tomatoes and do good, and still have salsa. So it's all good. Well, I hope so. Yep, yep. So this week, our plant of the week. Well, oftentimes we talk about a plant of the week. This week we're going to talk about plants. All right. Of the week we've got our every year we have our master gardener plant sale. It's our biggest fundraiser to fund all the educational things we do throughout yep. the county. So if you like plants, and who doesn't, you wouldn't if you weren't watching this. That's right. That's if you right. were watching this, but uh, it's an online plant sale. It's active right now. You can go to our website and get to it. We've got over over 250 different varieties awesome. of plants. We've got them separated out by annuals and perennials, and <clears throat> we've got a new category for organic pollinator plants, if you're wanting to go full on organic, yep. these are certified organic. Certified organic or, for, for pollinators. Plants. And then we're doing kind of a fun thing this year in a new partnership with the Gathering Place. Yeah. You know, we've yeah. been talking to them about uh, working together on things. So uh, if you've been to the Gathering Place, which we hope you have, you've seen it, it's, it's like a horticultural. Uh, I'm pretty the, jealous. Yeah, I'm pretty just, jealous. Like, look at that, look yeah. at that, look at that, look How at that. How do they do that? Yeah, so, yeah. So anyway, we've got 10, 12, 15 plants on our plant list that uh, you've seen at the gathering places. So we've got like a separate sort yeah. for that kind of a, as seen. Kind of a fun. <laughs> instead of as seen on TV, yeah. as seen at the gathering place. Yeah. So they got some of those there listed that you could have, you know, I guess you could take the gathering place home. Yeah, that's right. Some of their some plants the and we offer them as well. And they're good, good, solid plants. So right. it, it, most of these plants that we buy, you know, they're locally sourced. We'll get them from, from grow, growers around. And um, so they're pre, a lot of these are pre-sold. Um, so we, you'll, you'll pay for them beforehand and we'll, we'll order them and then you'll come pick them up. Right. Uh, what was that date? The middle My pickup day is April 16th. So okay. the, the bulk of the sale is online. You can look, you can shop, there's pictures, there's descriptions, you can think about it, but place your order online and then come April 16th is pickup day from 9 to 7 o'clock at night. You drive up there, you tell them who you are, you present your sheet, and uh, we'll actually load the plants in your, in your car for you. Yep. Yep. But it doesn't end there. We also have what we call a pop-up plant sale that day, which are maybe some things we, that weren't available online. We didn't know if we'd get online or just... Didn't know if they looked good enough to list yeah. online, so we, we, we bring them in that day. We right. bring them in that day, so that pop-up plant sale. And we want while you're there, we want to get some more money from you, so uh, <laughs> that's where it's at. The, those are usually the funner plants because we don't know what they are, whether it's a cactus or that organic, you know, that organic pollinator section. Or there's just a lot of different things there that you that w that we're not able to list on the on the pre-sold one. So that's that's a pop-up plant sale or that day of plant sale. Be be a be fun to come out and look at and check out. Yeah, well, and another big thing on there is uh, milkweed. We always have <clears throat> milkweed, and the milkweed is always the first thing to go. Pe people are waiting at the door at 9 a.m. They come rushing in, and then on six, next thing you know, I don't know how many, two or 3,000 milkweed plants oh, we have. Last year. <laughs> They're down to one They're table. They just evaporated. Yeah, you know? yeah, so yeah. Uh, come early, shop, get your plants, place your online order, and uh, you'll get some great plants, and you'll help support the Master That's Gardeners. That's right. It's, a, it's a good project. Check it out on the website. All right, now's the time. Now's the time. Oh man, we've got a lot of things. Now's the time. We're getting it's, it's busy, but if we're talking turf and weeds, we're talking pre-emergent. Pre-emergent. Now's the time to be thinking pre-emergent. We can't talk about vegetables all the time, so now we can talk <laughs> about like, some good stuff. I can stuff. talk about vegetables all the time. <laughs> no, yeah. now is a good time to start putting pre-emergent down. Um, right. You know, we're getting into the, we're trying to get trying to transition. Uh, we're getting out of the winter uh, into the, the spring and summer growing conditions, so the weeds are transitioning as well. So they're starting to think about germinating, and we need to stop them from germinating. Um, so we do that with a pre-emergent, uh, pretty simple. Um, think it's a chemical that, you know, it's an invisible layer that 
keeps things from germinating, keeps those seeds from germinating. It's not a simple process like that, but that's the way I like to describe it. So as long as we have that invisible layer out there on that lawn, or even in our flower bed, uh, as long as that invisible layer there, we're gonna have less germination of those weed seeds that are Which that are translates there. to less weeds. That's right, yeah, less, less germination. Get them early, we always say hit them early, and this one's real early before they even come up. So we, we have that kind of that window now uh, until they start germinating about that middle of March to middle of April. Crabgrass is gonna start germinating about that March, April time frame. So if we have that layer out there, then a uh, chemical layer, it's gonna keep those seeds from germinating. So uh, now's the perfect time to do that in our lawns. There's a lot of different products out on the market. You're usually gonna hear them called preventers, uh, like crabgrass preventers. Don't worry about the crabgrass because we're, we're gonna cover a lot more than just crabgrass. But again, that's that marketing term where people can recognize crabgrass as a weed, so they're gonna put crabgrass preventer. But it's just a pre-emergent. Um, it's a lot of them are, you know, they'll work for your flower bed or your lawns or even some of your vegetables can can hang in can, these chemicals are going to be put on to keep them uh, from germinating. So, you know, that visible layer, the one thing we got to worry about is that once we're there, we can't aerate. We don't want to aerate. We don't want to mess up that layer. We don't want to even plant like we would do in a flower bed. So if, if, we, if we're going to do a flower bed, make sure it's like a perennial bed where we're not going to be disturbing that soil. So once that layer is disturbed, then those weeds are free to come up through there. So keep that in mind. Um, flower beds may not quite be time unless we're not going to disturb it but our lawns our lawns it's the perfect time uh, another thing to do is if we're in a Bermuda lawn perfect time to add glyphosate in with it um, so whether we're using a liquid or a granular pre-emergent if we're using a liquid it's good it's a good time to put that uh, glyphosate in there and that's that's going to kill everything green so anything in Bermuda grass it's dormant right now so anything green in that Bermuda grass is going to be a weed or going to be, you know, non-Bermuda. So it, it's best to go ahead and get that killed out as well. So keep that in mind, glyphosate added with the Roundup, glyphosate's Roundup, uh, that's kind of, it's one of the forms, but there's a lot of other forms of, of glyphosate out there that, that will do good. So you have, you know, about till the middle of March. Uh, it, it just depends, it depends on what Mother Nature's gonna throw at us. Right. And uh, we're looking pretty warm, so um, we may be, we may have to cut that off the first of March. March. You know, whenever that Bermuda starts greening up and, you know, that 10 to 20 percent green, anything above 10 is probably too green and we can't put glyphosate down. We can always put pre-emergent. That's not going to hurt the Bermuda, but it's just adding that glyphosate in there. And we're kind of at a window and that window closes pretty quick in the spring and around that March time frame. So check it out. Be careful. And if you want to know, ask the master, call, call them in and and they'll tell you if you know if, if we're too green, or just get out there and look. And if you see see very much Bermuda grass, you may have to think twice about adding glyphosate in as a spray. But that combo is the best application of herbicides we can add. It's going to kill anything green, any weeds out there now, and then it is going to keep weed seeds from germinating. But that is on Bermuda grass only. Of course, we can't do it on fescue and or zoysia. So. Uh, those two were just looking at a uh, just a plain pre-emergent. Well, the the bottom line on the pre-emergent is if you treat now, it'll save you more trouble later, later. on. That's like right. you're not going to be out there spraying like we mentioned on like the 2,4-D and dicamba the, to get rid of the weeds because the weeds will be already less than that, they would have been. That's correct. And that you know even on my I've got three acres that I that I mow and I don't take care of it a lot, but I will put this application on. I'll put a liquid pre-emergent and I will put a glyphosate application on. And that may be the only time I'll spray. I mean, it's gonna clean up everything. It's gonna get my winter weeds uh, killed. The hen bit's starting to come on right now, that purple, purple weed. Um, and then POA is that little grassy weed where we're seeing little bitty white seeds. It's a smaller right. one, but they, it's just a lot of it out there. But any, anything green and growing right now, it, it takes care of it real well. And then it keeps them from germinating. So now is the perfect time. We've got a fact sheet that lists all the pre-emergent 
Um, Talk about weed and feed. That that one that one well, kind of comes yeah, to mind. Well, if you go to the store, what I mean, uh, any of the big shops, you're going to see they're going to have piles of bags of fertilizers, and it's weed and feed, and it's like, well, God, I can perfect. I can do two in one. Perfect. Yeah. Except like we were saying, now right now is not the best time to be feeding. Yeah, if we don't. We're, if it's Bermuda. Bermuda you just kind yeah. Of, we don't want to fertilize a lot now because it's not green. It's just sitting right. there. All that we talked about it in the past of being immobile in the soil. Nitrogen's mobile, so it's going to get used up. So it's going to the plants is going to pull up a little, but it's not going to pull up that much until it's really actively growing. So a weed and feed situation has fertilizer and it has a pre-emergent in it. So that that one, you know, it may work great for fescue right now because we're wanting we're needing to fertilize fescue. Right. Um, so and then needing a pre-emergence, so that may work great for fescue right now. But for Bermuda, we don't need we don't want to fertilize a lot, but we do need the weeds, uh, weed part of it. So um, the if you can just find one, no need to pay for it now. Right. Save 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 later. But uh, if you can just find a pre-emergent, whether it is a granular or a liquid, then um, it would be it now would be the time. And see, I'm kind of. At the other end of the spectrum, I've kind of gotten myself into the state of the mind. It's like, oh, that hen bed and dandelions are so pretty. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I, I just got to went rogue and just like, I'm just not going go. to worry about it. Yeah. It's just going to grow and then it'll, it'll, yeah, it'll and, be there and gone. And that's perfectly fine. I mean, you yeah. know, our, our, our levels and, you know, how much weeds you want is, is different. But, you know, I, it is. I mean, there you can usually mow them and, and it'll be fine. And, you right. know, it, as long as it's not looking too bad. Because they're not taking over. Yeah. And, I, and, again, i got a bigger area. So uh, the purple the purple hem bit is, uh, I think, kind of ugly. So <laughs> I will go ahead and spray it. But, right. but again, some don't mind. And that's fine. It's, yeah. it's all to one. It's all good. So, But, but yeah, oh. look at pre-emergent. If you have any other questions on that, give us a call or send us an email and, uh, it don't overcomplicate it. It's not. A, it's not too complicated. Um, the main thing is to get it out there and get that la layer set before those seeds start germinating. Because right. if they start germinating, most of these pre-emergent won't control them. They only stop the germination. So uh, if they're if they're up, it, it, they won't they won't be too effective. And a cautionary tale, because I know this because I have done it. Do not put down a pre-emergent and then later come back and and seed your yard. And need to seed and get fescue. out there. It's like we well, can you can seed fescue in the spring, can't yeah. you? Yeah. yeah, but if you put a pre-emergent down, guess what's not going to grow? If, you if you're doing if it's doing its job, it's going to keep it from germinating. Yeah. I had that problem for a couple of years years ago. It's like, gosh, I guess I just can't grow any grass. Yeah, but, yeah. No, that's so fine. that's that's what it is. But yeah, yeah. Lot, uh, don't overcomplicate it. Uh, it's a great thing to look at look ahead to, and it'll help you later on. Trust me. All right. So, questions of the week. This week, the first one comes from Sylvia. She says, I want to grow potatoes this potatoes. year, which is good. Potatoes are fun. But the question is, when can I plant? When's the right time to plant potatoes? It's getting close. It is getting close. It's getting it close. could be. It's getting close. Depends it could on be the now. soil temperature. Yeah, Ultimately, it, is. it depends on the soil temperature. Yeah, it's hard for us to forecast it, and, and uh, so you know you're looking at a you're looking at a, a, a soil temps around 50 on on potatoes. 50 I mean, and up. 50 and up. You don't right. want to you don't want to plant too early because it'll be too cool and it can rot them. But uh, you know any time around that in end of February March time frame that's usually when we plant. Right. Um, onions similar too if you can find onions this early, but. You know, if we, the way this winter was, has been, it's it's been pretty warm. So it, it may be time to plant potatoes. So. Well, last time I checked, and you can check the uh, Mesonet. If you yep. just Google Mesonet, M-E-S-O-N-E-N-E-T, -E -E yep. every county has got a weather station. Some of them have multiple, multiple weather, weather stations. stations. But you get on there and look at the one closest to you, you can find out weather data, water, soil temps. Soil temps. Two inches. I mean, various lots depths, of data, lots, lots of, of data there. There's Great, useful data for farmers, and you know, it, it doesn't only have the you know a, a, a station at top, but it's got probes in the bottom, you know, underneath right. the ground too. Whether it's under sod or exposed dirt, or or I said that dirt again, uh, <laughs> exposed soil, but right. a lot of different things on that mess. And it's a fun site to check out, and they. 
they they piggyback on on the radar with National Weather Service, so you've got that. Right. Um, but a lot of a lot of it's a cool site to look if you're worried about degrees and when things are germinating and when you know what 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 things you know what's out there now and soil temperatures. So. And if you want to follow them on Facebook, their posts are hilarious. He does a pretty good job <laughs> with, with some well, of them. I think they're just pretty funny. Yeah, anyway. we'll share those here and there with with ours and just just to hear it. But but potatoes are you know that that 50 degree is kind of the the main thing and you know it that's going to happen it's a window around the middle to end of february is probably the best time to do it um right. so we'll see it's it's getting time it's pretty close it's getting time it's in, the, it's in the mid 40s right now but that's a good question good question all right next question <clears throat> comes from Forrest. he says as i shop for plants online i guess not our plants but just generally online <clears throat> i see they are referencing a growing zone what zone are, are we in? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> it is. Um, you know, they... Uh, this plant, is the official map. This yeah. is the USDA plant hardiness zone. Right. Is what, is what it right. is. He so said it. <laughs> this is a, this is a, a cooler, uh, a, a cool map. So it's for low temperatures. We also have a heat zone that they've kind of added. Mm -hmm. A little different, but uh, a similar idea. This... What, the way I like to describe this, this gives us a baseline of where, right. where we're at. It's kind of a starting point. Right. So, uh, as a rule. A, as a rule. Like, yeah. our, our, our general zone is a, a 7A to 7B in the Tulsa area. And then you start getting outside the, 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 uh, the urban area, the concreted area. Then it starts kind of getting a little, changing a little. Microclimates, there, there could be microclimates in any garden or any, and there more likely are microclimates right. where you can grow this in this area of the garden, but you can't on this area. So it's protected or insulated or something different to help, you know, change that temperature. But I like to think of this as kind of a, just a kind of a reference point for when you're talking to your friends in Kansas or Colorado or whatever, right. you know, oh, we're 7A or 7B and is where our zone is. So if you're, if you're shopping and you know a plant that says what, 12 or well, yeah, if, if you're shopping and you find, oh, I really want one of those zone 12. Oh, oh no, that's, that's a tropical not, plant. That's, I'm going to have to bring that in every probably winter. Not work. Okay, something else. Yeah, yeah. But this is good. This is a good reference. And, and again, um, years change. This is average. So, you know, one a few years back, no water got to negative 40 or something like that. Yeah. So that's going to throw an average off. But in general, this is a good reference point and, you know, look for plants close to that area. Or if you're a gardener, get way out of that area and see if you can make them live. See if so, you can do it. <laughs> but, but again, check this one out and then check the, the, the heat zone as well. That's kind of a, it, it's been out for 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. and, it, it these both have caught on, but we don't we don't use them as much just because things change so different for, even from year to year. This is just an average kind of a ballpark to to give it a try. Yeah, well, yep, good question though. All right, so that wraps up this week. We'll be back next time and uh, see you then. It'll be garden season by then. It'll be garden season then. It'll be we'll good. Be full on. All right, see you next time. Have a good spring so far.